Everything very good? All right, so it's six o'clock. Thank y'all for coming. The slimmer crowd this time around. I know we're competing with uh, Dixie Youth Opening Week, but I um, also know we've got friends who will be joining us online. And so we're, um, we're excited to be able to share this presentation with you. I'm going to tell you, a lot of people have come together to put this together, and I think you'll see that as uh, different people come up and talk about uh, their part of the plan. So we will go ahead and get started. Um, again, this is our restructuring plan before we were just beginning the conversation um, and opening the discussion, and from that discussion is how we have built this plan. But I... Um, I started with this quote, don't be afraid to give up the good, to go for the great, because that's really where we feel we are right now. So um, tonight's presentation, we'll start with the feedback and the planning, and then we'll move to the um, number one priority, which is buses and car riders, and then we'll talk about academics and instruction, and then athletics and extracurricular. So um, in the feedback and planning um, portion of this, uh, we have gathered feedback um, in the form of surveys from parents, teachers, and community members. Thank you so much for giving us your insight. We, uh, we perused over all of those suggestions and the pros and the cons and tried our best to work through all of those um, things. We uh, met with grade level teachers and with our athletic coaches uh, Ms. Meredith met with her Special Education Advisory Council, and then uh, we finished up yesterday with an Athletic and Transportation Committee meeting. And so those are just some of the ways that we've gathered feedback, um, in addition to phone calls, emails, messages, and face-to-face -face meetings. And so um, the conversations have been really good and very productive, and we've learned a lot about ways that we needed to tweak this uh, to make it work uh, for our kids and our parents. So there are some major shifts that we um, needed to address uh, as a result of the conversations. And one of the big um, pushes that we received from our uh, community is that uh, Union Central should be the school that houses grade four and five. And it makes sense if you think about um, the structure of Union Central. It is a two-story building. It has lockers. There's a large auditorium. And so if you think about your fourth and fifth graders, you've got graduation, you've got dare. Uh, we've talked about doing theater at this age. You've got social studies fair, beta, 4-H. And so um, all those things can take place in the auditorium. And then there's a separate gym. And so you're not trying to have all of your activities <coughs> in one place. It has a very large football, um, a large playground that can be used for football practice because that's the ages that we um, have a football. And there's access to the baseball field for expansion of our athletics program. And we'll talk about that some more, but in the years to come, we'd like to add baseball and softball. And it makes perfect sense with it being right there beside Brownville. So that's a major shift. The Union Central would be fourth and fifth grade, and Columbia Elementary would be second and third grade. Still keep um, Grayson Elementary as kindergarten first. Another shift um, that we learned about transportation is that we needed to separate our bus lines from our car drop-offs and pickups at each school. And so we've worked on plans to do that. Um, we realize we're going to have to have earlier morning drop-off um, for elementary students so that our parents, if they choose to drive their kids from school to school, that so they, they, they can do that. Um, same thing with buses is they'll, they'll drop off earlier. Afternoon dismissal will begin at elementary schools instead of the high school. And, and that was just a result of having conversations with bus drivers and then with teachers to look at the minutes that are required in our day. And what we found out is that when we moved from a five-day week to a four-day week, everything was based on the high school minutes. And we left our current drop-off at the elementary schools and then come to the high school and then pick up at the high school and then back to the elementary. We left that structure in place. And so we've had a lot of extra minutes at the elementary level that we don't necessarily have to have. And so because of the conversations we had, we realized we can dismiss earlier from the elementary schools and then go to the high school. So we'll actually be getting kids home earlier because they won't have to go back to the elementary schools to pick up kids. And so um, that was a not, we had no idea until we started having the conversation that that was even a thing. 
Um, and the other thing is that because we have the three elementary schools, we're going to have arrivals and dismissals in three waves with buses. And so you'll have a wave one and a wave two and a wave three. And Coach Wells will talk more about that um, in that section. The third shift um, is a result of conversations with teachers in that we had originally thought we, we knew we could hire a music and art teacher. We thought we'll do two days of music here and two days of art and then we'll move. And so we actually have, and I'm going to call names because these were great ideas, but Ms. Owens has a music background. And she's, you know, gave her expertise and said, you know, really for your, your smaller kids, they need consistency. And I, we never would have thought about that. And so one of the big shifts is going to be that your Grayson, like kindergarten and first grade students, will have music all fall, and then they will switch and do art in the spring. And that way they have that consistency with those skills. And then your Columbia students will just do the opposite, and they'll have art in the fall, and then music in the spring. Our um, Union Central 4th and 5th grade students can handle two and two, and so we'll have that person doing art two days a week and music two days a week, but it's developmentally appropriate for those ages, and, and I appreciate the insight that came from uh, those conversations. So those are the major shifts that we have. Um, the second part is our buses and car riders, and I know that that's a... Um, a big uh, topic for us, but um, we haven't worked out. I'm going to ask Coach Wells if he'll come up and, and talk with you about what that's going to look like. Okay, we know that uh, the transportation issue is probably going to be one of the biggest things that we're going to have to deal with. Uh, but like Ms. McCann said, you know, the, the conversations that we have with all of our current bus operators. Uh, and getting their feedback on how we can make this plan work, uh, started to develop several different plans. And there's no one plan right now that's gonna fit this, but we've taken a lot of them and we've, we've put them together to come up with right now what we think is a pretty good situation. Uh, what we're looking at right now is your current schedule uh, is that you know the doors open at all the schools at 720. Uh, breakfast begins basically at that same time when those doors open at all the elementaries high school, junior high. Uh, the target bell ranks about uh, 750, uh, and then we dismiss the elementaries at 340, 345, 350, uh, and then the high school, pre-K, junior high, they dismiss from this main campus at about 415 to 420. What we're looking at doing though, and this was a conversation that Ms. McCann had with the elementary principals that said, well, we're gonna need to, to adjust our times. If we're gonna be able to get the, the buses to each school now, which right now, currently, the buses drop here at the high school, the pre-K, the junior high, and then their one designated elementary school. So all we're asking them to do now is just go to the other two elementary schools. But we needed that to make sure that our timing was right to fall into what we need to have as far as getting them in, having breakfast, having the instruction, dismissing them at the end of the day. So with, once Ms. McCann had those conversations, the, the principal said, okay, and then again, once they found out, well, the time that had not been adjusted since the four-day week began, uh, they looked at it and said, okay, we'll open our, the elementaries will open up at 7.05. They can start serving their breakfast about 7.15. Their tardy bells will ring about 7.40. The high school, pre-K, junior high will not change any of their times. They will stay the same. Dismissal, though, from elementary schools will be about 3.40, 3.50, and then 4 o'clock. <laughs> morning bus routes basically all of your buses are going to run their normal routes so what we designate is Grayson routes coming from the south Union Central routes from the central part of the area all the way up to the uh, west on the uh, Washtenaw and also uh, Jackson Parish lines and then the Columbia routes which run towards Washtenaw Parish on 165 all the way out to Big Ridge uh, so those bus routes, all of them are staying the same. They're going to pick up just like they would normally do. Pickup times may vary between 5 to 10 minutes, just depending on the route. Now, the drop-offs are going to occur basically of what we want to have is waves. We want to have buses coming in at about 7 to 8 buses at each elementary school dropping off. So not all buses are going to be lined up at one school in the morning dropping off at one time. They're going to come in in various ways. So the first elementary will be will drop off about 705. 
Then they'll proceed to the second elementary at about 715, to the third elementary about 725, and then here on the high school campus for uh, high school, junior high, and pre-K at about 735 for them. Again, these times, they're, 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 they can vary. Uh, and it's going to take a little while to make sure we get it right, about maybe two, three weeks, hopefully, maybe shorter than that. We all know that weather, mechanical bus failure, uh, substitute bus driver, uh, various things can disrupt your time. But we think we can we definitely make these times fit in and get every student and every bus to each school at that designated time. Oh, yeah. uh, and uh, as, as of now, with our current schedule that we have, some of the buses are already sitting at the schools waiting for those doors to open up to drop those kids off. Because we can't drop any kids off until the principal and the new teachers are out there and they're ready to accept the kids. So we already know, based on the information that we've gathered from our uh, bus operators, uh, looking at you know what time do they pick up their first kid in the morning, what time do they get to those schools, and looking at those times. So there's probably not going to be any adjustment in a pickup time in the morning. And then same thing in the afternoon, looking at what time their last drop-off was. More than likely with the new schedule in place, the students are probably going to get home a little bit quicker because they won't have to go back to that elementary school once they leave here to pick up. They'll already be on the bus, gather up our high school, junior high, pre-K kids, and we dismiss them and put them on the road. Okay, well, we'll do it again. We'll do it again. Anyway. But the afternoon bus routes, again, they'll start at the elementary schools. Now, the we, reason we have this also in place for them to start at the elementary schools is we have to have evacuation buses at each school. So there has to be a minimum of four buses at each elementary school, Columbia, Union Central, and Grayson. And then we have to have enough evacuation buses here at the high school also for high school kids, pre-K, and the junior high. Pickups will again occur in waves. All buses are going to run their same normal routes. They'll pick up starting at elementary one, whichever one that may be designated at 340. Then they'll move to their second one at 350, their third one at four o'clock, arrive here on campus uh, at the high school campus about 410. We may have to adjust the dismissal time here to accommodate that maybe by about five minutes, we think, uh, and to uh, be able to get the high school, uh, the pre-K and the junior high loaded up. Once we dismiss, they're not going back to the elementary, so they're going on home with them. Now this may look very complicated, and it did to me when I first saw it, but this was information that we gathered from our bus operators. And looking at color coding their buses, like we've done right here, the red basically is a uh, Union Central, the blue designates uh, for uh, Grayson. The yellow designates for Columbia. Trying to keep it involved with the school colors as close as we could, even though we are coming together right now. Uh, looking at where their routes start, what routes they go to, then we started looking at giving them first choice. Where do you want to tr start your drop off in the morning? Which, one, which school do you want to go to first? and then giving them that first preference and then putting it into this formula and basically lining it out where the buses are going to be able to meet and uh, go to each elementary school. Again, not all 25 at one time, but breaking them down into about seven to eight buses per school per drop off. So you'll see right here, that let's say that Mr. Mr. Yerby's bus right here, his first drop off is gonna be at Union Central at 705. Then he'll go to Columbia, leave Union Central, go to Columbia, and hopefully drop off there about 7.15, probably maybe a little bit quicker. Then he'll proceed on uh, to Grayson at about 7.25, and then he'll come on back here, drop off the high school, the junior high, and the pre-K, and then his final thing is, is he goes and parks his bus back down at the bus barn, and that would be a bus that we would use for an evacuation purpose down there. In the afternoon, since his bus is down there at Grayson, that would be his first pickup in the afternoon. He would go on and load Grayson's up at about 3.40. He would proceed on to Union Central, pick those up at about 3.50, uh, then go to Columbia, pick those up at 4 o'clock, 
come back up the highway, be in line at about 410. We dismiss high school, pre-K, junior high, load up, everybody goes home. So that's kind of how we, we line those out right there. Again, that's not set in stone. This is not the actual uh, plan that we have, but this is what we're working on as far as lining the buses up with the bus driver's first preference is to schools that they wanted to go to first. I do want to give credit to your <laughs> I do want to give credit to Heather Darden. Um, she is a bus driver at Grayson Elementary, but she's a former math teacher. And so uh, I gave her this and I said, I need you to solve this math riddle for me. And so she put it together so that everyone could be equal and we'd have those different ways going. So a lot of work went into this, a lot of math questing and timing drop-offs. Uh, she, she formulated those times based on the average uh, loading and unloading at Grayson and then Central and at Columbia, and she, the longest time was at Grayson because there are more kids, and so she based everything on a four minute uh, drop off and uh, loading period. So I do want to uh, shout out to her for putting this together because there's no way I could have solved that problem. No, I couldn't have solved it either. I had worked on it, but not to the extent of this right here. Uh, so the travel for, for like, if uh, faculty and staff, you know, if you have a child uh, that needs to go to one of the uh, one of the elementaries or to another elementary to the campus. We're going to have designated buses that are going to be picking picking those kids up here at the high school or pre-K or the junior high or one of the elementary schools, and we'll get those transported to those schools. Same thing in the afternoon. We'll have designated bus that will pick them up and get them back to you know their parents at whatever school that they may need to go to. So like if I were working at Union Central and I needed my kid to get Columbia to Columbia, I could look at this sheet here and know, okay, Mr. Yerby's going to pick up at Union Central at 705, so I've got to be there in time to put my kids on the bus to Columbia. Or if my child was going to Grayson, I would look at which one would go straight to Grayson. Because I, I might want to put them on the bus that doesn't go all over the place, it goes straight there. So you will have options. And then again, um, if you have those that need to get to the junior high or they come there, there's always the evacuation bus that comes back. And so you might have to put your child on that bus. And the same thing in the afternoon when they go home, there are buses that automatically drive by the school because that's on their route. And so that would be the bus that brought your kids from the high school campus. Okay, with the color coding, we looked at this as a really, really good way of making sure that uh, the duty teachers and principal at those elementary schools know what buses are coming in. So we're going to look at color coding those buses similar to what was already on that uh, uh, schematic there. Uh, and uh, there will be a window decal up in the front uh, that may or may not have the, the bus driver's name or the number because sometimes we have to take our buses off the line for athletics events or other trips that may be going on or uh, they may be uh, disabled and may be working on it. But anyway, all buses are going to have some type of designated color to designate for their school. Uh, and it'll be in the front windshield. Uh, and then also, I'll let Ms. McCann talk about the, the children. So, so this idea came from um, a teacher, Caitlin Clark, uh, and I think that the pre-K has used something similar, but we'll buy these plastic tags that go on their backpacks. And so I know this is great, but you can order it in blue. And so you'll have whichever route the kids are going on will be attached to their backpack. And then in that information there, we'll have the child's name, the child's address, the, the number of their pickup, and the bus that they're supposed to get on. And that way we know for sure that we're getting people. It's just an extra layer of security to be sure that our kids are um, getting where they're supposed to get. Uh, I talked with Ms. Coates, uh, pre-K students, four-year-olds can get anywhere in the parish. So I know that our, our K through five kids can do the same. And so um, we'll just, we just have to have a system to make sure. I do want to say no kid is going to be swapping buses. Everyone will get on a bus and ride that bus to their house. That's something that came up uh, yesterday, or I had some questions there. So we'll make sure that we have kids where they're supposed to go and what, which pickup and um, time they're supposed to uh, come off on. Thank you. All right, so the next thing 
that we had to decide um, to discuss is separating our bus drop-offs and pickups from our car riders. Um, and so we have this at each school. I'll do my best to kind of to show this. But um, here we have 165, and so you've got the high school down here, and the bridge is that way. Currently, every, um, the buses follow this route. They come in kind of behind Max or that way, and they come down Blank Street and turn by Columbia Elementary here and then come out. Well, your drop-offs and pickups come down this road, and so what we're going to do is we're going to reroute that traffic so they cut in front of Subway and come down in front of the post office and around the block so that everyone is coming out in the same direction. And, and this made sense. I spoke with the mayor, um, Ms. Hannah Springer, about having, they have Mr. Cedric who is here. He'll just stand there and since we have three waves, we don't need the buses and the cars bumping, you know, matching up with each other. He can just stop the cars and let the buses on out and then he can let the cars on out. And then the next wave of buses comes through. And so they're able to do that in what we kind of call a contra flow there. Because if you remember, we're going to have three waves. So you'll have, you know, seven or eight buses, and then you'll let them go. The beauty of this is that your parents can now start dropping off at 7.05. We will have duty teachers. So if you need to get to work or you need to get your kids to another school, you don't have to wait for that 7.20 time. And you'll just be able to kind of contra flow there. Same thing with pickups in the afternoon. So, um, so that's the change at Columbia. At Union Central, um, currently everyone uses this uh, circular drive here, cars, pickups, and buses. And so what we're going to do is reroute the traffic from cars to the road called Wendell Drive that goes around the back of the playground. And so we have them come around here, and then we've squared off this fence right here and can pour a walkway for our students to come in here. Again, when the buses are coming through, we stop the traffic. When they're done, we let the traffic go. And so that way we're all moving in the same direction there. And then uh, this is the conversation that got it all started. Uh, Ms. Penny Sue Brown brought this to our attention um, at Grayson Elementary. And so here we have 165. Here you're going to Kelly and that way back towards the high school. Currently, all the buses and cars come and use the same and, and the traffic gets backed up. It's, it's a nightmare. I've seen it. <laughs> I've heard about it and I went and saw it and then just trying to fix that. So. Um, he suggested that we look at this land right here where they had those turnouts, where it used to be the old, um, I think there was a convenience store, maybe a gas station there. Well, it turns out we own that land. Um, so all we have to do is take this drive right here and do a little dirt work and put in a drive so that we can now route all of our car riders this way and they're totally separate from our buses. And so that was um, a beautiful idea and one that um, just worked itself out that we'll be able to do and separate the um, buses from the car riders. And that'll make all three of those um, drop-offs in the morning and pickups in the afternoon a lot easier on our bus drivers, on our staff and faculty, and our parents. Um, again, we'll start those at 7.05 in the morning, so that, that's a win-win for us, we think. So uh, the next part um, is um, on our academics and instruction. And so um, what we have um, gathered from feedback is that we would rather see Grayson Elementary be the kindergarten and first grade center, Columbia Elementary be the second and third grade center, and then Union Central be the fourth and fifth grade center. And those numbers, again, are projected on our enrollment for next year. I want to remind you about the, the unity and the reason for us having these conversations. You know, I, I would not even propose this if we did not all start together and finish together. But here we have an opportunity because of the way that we're set up for our kids to be together from start to finish. Restructuring them allows them to do that and it doesn't just put them back together in sixth grade. It allows them to go to school with their church friends, their ballpark teammates, their family and friend regardless of where they live. This also helps with our, our kids who move from, ha from location to location based on housing. Um, and then, of course, just the beauty of it is that growing up together with diversity as part of everyone's daily life contributes to unity, understanding, and accepting the differences of others. So with that in mind, um, I, I got this idea from our um, friend Tamala Hutchison that we needed a visual 
about what we're actually doing. And so here is the current structure of our elementary schools. You've got Grayson who services K through five, Columbia K through five, and Union Central K through five. And I kind of look at this and liken it to, you know, there was a time in the medical world where we went to the same doctor. We went to a general practitioner and that doctor delivered our babies and they fixed our broken bones and they fixed our colds and did all those things and that worked well. And it's not saying that this doesn't work well, but as time evolves, we evolve and with, with education, just like with the medical field, you now go to specialists and you go because science has evolved and you have all of these, these new things that you know and these specialties that you're understanding. It's the same in education. We have all of our literacy goals and we have math goals and we have this testing and we have this, you know, content that we're trying to learn. And so what we're looking at is rather than those five is let's really focus on two grade levels at each school that are developmentally appropriate and that we can specialize and offer the best education for our kids. Not saying what we've been doing is wrong, it's just us evolving just like they do in the medical world. And so with that, I'm going to ask Ms. Adams to come up and talk about the, um, the instructional side of it um, from her meetings with, her, um, with the elementary teachers. Good evening. We had um, a scheduled three elementary meetings, a K-2, uh, a K-1, a 2-3, and a 4-5. Um, but everybody was invited to attend these meetings, no matter what their preference was or potential was. I think Ms. Owens made every meeting for me, and some of them, and then some people joined online because of life and uh, had a board member or two and uh, sent them the video and the transcript there. So, had lots of valuable input. And I was very pleased about the open conversation and the honesty that I got from the teachers. And uh, I think everybody's going to get what they want. So we started out with K and 1. And we talked about how many minutes they would need per subject. What is enough? What is not enough? And so we came up with minutes. Our target minutes for instruction is 431. For elementary and so we were able to meet that and in most cases well, all cases we went above 431 minutes so we were wondering because of the earlier start times and you know earlier dismissals but uh, we made those minutes work and that's the only reason it could work <laughs> if, if we did uh, we had discussions about lowering nap time and I was like mm, you know but we, we thought about some adjustments, but in the end, we did not have to do that. Um, as you see, most of your um, instructional minutes um, is devoted to your core reading, your phonics, and your intervention. And then math is, is your next uh, highest minutes, science and social studies, uh, in the upper grades, it has the same value. In the lower grades, it's not, you know, as much to teach for science and social studies. So we were able to lower those um, and be realistic with our time. Um, specials, your PE, music, art, computer lab, that's a 90-minute block, which will allow our teams of teachers to uh, plan together in teams. And uh, on occasion, when I need to have district meetings or plannings with them, it'll allow us to arrange for parents to watch the others while I meet with all teachers. Instead of going school to school to school, week to week to week, we can knock that out in three days. And everybody's hearing everything at one time. Lunch, we're required federally to have 30 minutes, and so we have to make that happen. And uh, 30 minutes of recess time, we were able to keep that. And our intervention time, of course, kindergarten is nap, but um, they have their intervention worked into their reading minutes. And so we still have that accelerate time, and that time is for 
Kids that need extra help outside of your core instruction, whether it be ELA or math. And um, it's not for just kids, it's for all kids. It's not kids who just need help in an area. It may be enrichment for your kids that um, they are gifted or just a high flyer, uh, an honors person that uh, just needs that little extra push in instruction. So I've asked Ms. Guerrero, who is our district literacy specialist, to talk about um, the benefits that restructuring will have for literacy. So I'll pass the microphone. Good afternoon. And I, I'm excited just to share uh, what we are currently doing in our district to support our students in literacy. Our district's goal is to ensure our students are reading on grade level by the end of third grade. Now, there is an important literacy learning transition that takes place during elementary school. Until the end of third grade, students are learning how to read, but there is a transition or focus shift when they enter in fourth grade. They are now becoming reading to learn. And so I want to share what research has shown and how our district is supporting our students in literacy. Researchers have found that if 75%, just think about that, of students identify with reading problems and poor word identification skills in third grade will likely, unlikely, improve their reading skills by the end of eighth grade. And one thing I hate about it is that they'll lose that love of learning and, and that motivation diminishes. This is why it is so important for us to provide early prevention and intervention for our students. This year, we have done this by implementing, uh, implementing NTSS, which stands for Multi-Tiered Support System in grades K to 6. We begin this process by giving a literacy screener in grades K to 6 that shows us where our students were struggling in the foundations of reading. We use this data and develop a literacy plan specifically for each child. MTS meetings are held every four weeks where we sit down each literacy, with the literacy team and review each child's plan and literacy goals. We then share strategies and ideas and other resources to support our teachers and interventionists so they can, are able to go right then back into the classroom and support their students. We monitor progress to make sure each students are meeting their goals. If not, we discuss what do we need to do, what changes, and offer support. Now moving forward, I've had the privilege in to be able to sit in each school's meeting and see how valuable they are for each school. All the knowledge and support each person brings to the table each time we meet is just amazing to watch. And then new teachers have gathered ideas and strategies from seasoned teachers of things they have in their toolbox or tool belt that they can go back and learn from others. I can only imagine just how powerful this process will be if we're able to put our students and teachers in a center location in all in one location. The ideas and strategies and peer observations they have will be able for them just to step across the hall and do and see first uh, best practices firsthand. The possibilities will be unlimited. Also, think about how beneficial it would be for a teacher to step into another classroom and model best practices in that teacher's classroom with her own students. I've often heard, yes, that strategy works best in your room, but I want you to come try it in my classroom. Now, they'll be able to do this. They can just step across the hall and do that with that teacher's classroom and those students. Just how powerful that will be. In closing, I just want to, uh, I want to say I was against the plan for center schools when it was presented a few years ago. However, in my 29 years in Caldwell Parish, as my role changed from a teacher to an immigrationist to a principal and now as a district literacy specialist, I definitely can see how this transition to center schools has the potential to greatly impact our students and teachers of Caldwell Parish. This proposal will set the stage for a powerful exchange of ideas 
and knowledge as a cohort of teachers and students continue to grow. Ms. Whitman and I have worked closely this year to fine tune the foundational skills needed in, to enter kindergarten ready to learn to read. We are excited about the gains we have we are seeing at pre-K level. Just from the beginning of the year to the middle of the year is amazing. We are excited to see what the growth will look like at the end of the year. At the pre-K level, the teachers and students are in one location and are able to, to plan and receive immediate support to impact student learning. The growth and support they have received will continue to ensure that they are receiving what they need to be lifelong successful readers. Now, I'd like for you to hear more about the Early Childhood Literacy Program from Ms. Whitten, who is unable to be here tonight. She's at a wee ball game. Good evening. I'm sorry that I am unable to attend in person tonight, but I'm, but I'm at a wee ball game. And I would like to share just a little bit about the literacy program we are developing in early childhood and at pre-K and Kelly. Coming from an elementary background, I was able to see the literacy skills that incoming kindergarten students need in order to become successful readers. This year, we have made several changes in addition to the early childhood program in order to help prepare our students for success. I have seen firsthand how beneficial it is to the students and the teachers to all be in one building. The amount of back and forth exchanges and learning from each other has been unbelievable to watch. The students truly do have a school family because they are together all day, every day, with students who are their same age and size. This year, we have focused on phonological and phonemic awareness. This is where the students learn how to hear sounds and words and how to manipulate these sounds before they ever see actual letters. This helps to build the necessary foundation that will enable them to become strong readers by the time they reach third grade. We began this school year with 3% of our pre-K students on level in phonemic awareness. And by mid-year, 53% of the students had reached proficiency. We are excited to see how much growth the data will show at the end of the year. Our teachers are able to meet weekly to discuss plans for the upcoming week and to share ideas of how to meet the needs of each of the students. We have also begun intervention at both sites this year. This is to help prevent our students from falling between the cracks by missing those ever important foundational skills. I am confident that the pre-K students who will be entering kindergarten in the fall have been exposed to developmentally appropriate literacy practices and are well prepared to begin the kindergarten curriculum. We want to do everything possible to make the transition to kindergarten less traumatic for our preschool students. This proposed restructuring plan will benefit these students greatly because it will allow them to remain with their, school, their same school family and will enable the kindergarten teachers to work side by side daily as they teach the children of Caldwell Parish to become fluent readers. A plan similar to this to have center schools was presented about 10 years ago and at that time I was not for it. However, as I have changed roles to become a principal and now a literacy specialist, I definitely see the benefits for the students and all school employees. Our children need consistency more than anything, and this plan will allow them to remain with the same classmates until they walk across the stage to graduate as seniors. I know she hated not to be here, but she's at a wee ball game, and that's what we're fighting with, so I appreciate her putting that together. Um, I had no idea she and Ms. Brewer would say some of the same things, but it just shows how, how things have evolved, for sure. So, um, next I want to have, uh, please don't play. <laughs> I want to have Ms. Rebecca Meredith come and talk a little bit about planning for students with special needs. So as Ms. McCann said, um, as soon as we had the initial meetings, I met with my Special Education Advisory Council, and that's a group of parents, teachers, administrators, basically anybody who wanted to have a voice in decision-making about special education. 
And there were a couple of things that came up over and over and over again, um, no matter what the person's role was and no matter which meeting. People wanted to know how this was going to impact student services, how switching schools over and over again was going to impact our students, and how we could make sure that everything we did as part of this change would positively impact peer relationships between students with disabilities and other students. So I'm going to actually go backwards sort of through my slides, but currently many of our exceptional students may be the only person in their grade level or school building with a specific need or disability. And that means that other students may not have the opportunity to be around other kids who use AIDS for mobility, who are neurodivergent, or who might have to use a communica communication device or alternate means for communication until they get to the junior high. And by that point, those differences can seem unusual. They can even seem scary. By increasing the opportunities for inclusion at an early age, we're going to be able to better develop empathy and understanding between all of our student groups. And that idea of grouping kids together kind of goes through everything else. Like I said, all the parents want to know, how is this going to impact my child's services? And my answer to everyone has been, I actually think it's going to be better. Because right now, if you have a gifted student in our parish, there's a good chance at the elementary level that there's only going to be one child in third grade at Grayson who receives gifted services. And Ms. Broussard does an amazing job of getting them on Zoom with their peers or grouping two or three grade levels together, but there's nothing like having another student in your class the same age as you to push you and challenge you when that is your exceptionality. And right now it's just something that we're not able to give students, but through a restructuring program, we could make sure that those kids had an opportunity to be together all the time. And the same goes for all of our related services. If you have speech, APE, if you have occupational therapy or physical therapy in schools, you might be the only child on a campus that receives one of those services. And while we have people like Coach Dahlia that do an amazing job, you can imagine how challenging it is to have one child doing PE at a time. Or have only two students in the entire building that receive physical therapy and their schedules don't align. So having all of our kids together on similar campuses is really going to help our services improve. Something that um, recently has come to light to me is that if we are able to do this, it will allow our scheduling to be a little bit more flexible. We'll have less kids missing core instruction for their pullout time. But it will also be able to help our related service providers attend some of this planning time. And I know some of you are probably thinking, why in the world would I want a speech therapist in planning time? I'm going to pick on my first grade teacher that's sitting here, Miss Sydney. Can you see why it would be important to have an SLP at your planning time if you were trying to teach a kid how to read? Exactly. And we, ha we just haven't had the flexibility to do that now. So there's going to be a lot of chances for creative scheduling there that I think will really help us out. So the most significant concern, I think, that all of our parents that came to the SEAG all of our parents that answered questions in the survey, and not just students um, with disabilities, but all parents had was about transitioning. What are transitions gonna look like? So again, um, we have somebody else that's not here that she's at a wee ball game also, but she came to me and said, hey, I put together this plan for transitions. Um, why don't you kind of look at it? And I was like, oh, this is much better than anything I would have come up with. So I'm gonna let her share with you right now her transition plan.
My name is Leah Jackson, and I'm a special education teacher for the lower grades at Columbia Elementary. This is my eighth year of teaching, and I have been lucky enough to teach all eight years at Columbia Elementary. I taught first grade for a year, kindergarten for six years, and my current role is now my dream job in special education. When I first heard about the idea of stairs, I was against it. I did not want to leave this amazing school that I love dearly, and as a mama, I wanted my children to be able to go to Columbia Elementary School for their whole time. However, after I slowed down, stepped back, and thought about it, as a kindergarten teacher, special education teacher, and as a mama, I see more benefits for my students and for my own children. My little boy who tells me every day after school about a new friend he's made will be able to move to kindergarten with those very kids next year regardless of the school zone they live in. As a general education teacher, I've seen all of our students come together the past two years at summer camp, and they all work together great. We as teachers love our summer planning meetings because we are there together with different ideas to help each other. That will not be a once a year thing anymore. It will be easier to help each other when we have those difficult moments getting to a student to understand a new concept. As a special education teacher, being able to focus on one grade level is a dream. It is difficult to juggle multiple grade levels content at once. Being able to focus on one grade level for my students that already need the extra help will only benefit my students that much more. I have had the opportunity to talk to some of my parents of the students I teach now, and one big concern is how will my child be able to handle the transition to a new school site with a new teacher. At the time, I did not have an answer, but I assured them that I would do everything in my power to make the transition as easy as possible for them. I don't want these students to have to come that I have come to love and care about so much, be scared or anxious about this new possibility. I want them to feel confident and safe with their new school. I went home that night and I thought, if this is my child, what would I want someone to do with my child to make them feel safe and ready in their new environment? So I've come up with a plan that is made up of several steps to make the transition to new surroundings easier for our special education students. During the first transition stage, the current special education the <laughs> The current special education teacher will go with her students to tour the new campus. The students will stay with the people they are confident and comfortable with to see the new environment for the first time and really introduce them to the new campus. During the second transition, the special education students will go back to the new campus with their current special education teacher and work with the students that are from the other schools but also going to be in their same grade level to explore the campus by completing the scavenger hunt as a team. This way, students will begin to see students from other schools and begin to work with them, but still have the safety of their current teacher. During the third stage, the current special education teacher will go with her students to meet their new special education teacher for the 2023-2024 school year. We will focus on introducing the students to their new teacher. It will be a small group setting with the students that are from our current school, so they'll feel relaxed and in a playful environment. The children will still have the safety of their current teacher, but also have the opportunity to work with a new teacher. This will allow the teacher and the children to learn about each other, their likes and their dislikes. During the fourth stage, we will work on building the relationship with a new teacher while the current teacher is still in the room. This will also be in the relaxed, playful environment. We want our students to feel comfortable with their teacher before we try to add any kind of academics. After about 15 minutes, the current special education teacher will step out of the classroom for about five or 10 minutes. This will be a great time for the students to allow a new teacher for their wants and needs. During the fifth stage, the special education students will go with their school and go in, will go to their new school and go in a classroom with their new teacher. We'll be testing the new relationships that we've been working to build. They will play or complete a fun activity together in about 30 to 45 minutes. The old teacher will not go into the classroom unless the kids need them to. We want the students to rely on their new teacher, but if we see that this uh, child needs to see that familiar face, then she will come into the classroom at that time to assist. If the students do well, they will not need to come back for stage six where we will just be continuing to build the relationship with a new teacher. If a 
child needs to, we can set up another time for them to come and play with a new teacher so that they can start to feel comfortable and confident with them. These are just some of the steps that we plan to try to help our special education students feel comfortable. I know we all want what is best for our kids and we will go through links to make sure that, that, is, that they are ready to succeed this school year. That is one of the many reasons I love teaching in this district on Team Caldwell. Y'all, she's just amazing. And, and our teachers put this much thought into every day with their kids. But to, to hear, I saw this on paper, and then to hear this, I, there is so much detail that goes into making sure that our kids transition. <coughs> and um, that's something I never could have come up with, um, but only someone with that background could have. And so I appreciate that perspective. For sure. And, and that's for students with special needs. But if there are students who don't necessarily have identified needs and have the same fears about transition, we can do something similar because our goal is to help students transition more than just once in their educational career, but transition with the same and learn that, hey, when I move to this school, my same friends are there and, and it, I made it okay. So the next time I transition, it's going to be okay. And so we're not having that first big transition at sixth grade. And so it makes total sense. Um, next. All right. The next um, speaker we have, uh, Ms. Meredith and uh, Ms. Uh, Reedy, who is our new social worker. Um, a lot of the feedback we got, and even the night of the um, presentation, was on discipline and how would this help. And so I've asked them to come and talk about how this could improve behavior and social emotional learning. Okay, you guys are gonna have to forgive me on this one. Um, I was actually gonna hand the mic to this lady who had some emergency dental work done today and she actually cannot talk. So um, I'm gonna try to muddle my way through the things that she told me earlier. Um, so. Discipline came up a lot, and I know people like to say, oh, you know, we need to get disciplined like it was when we were in school. Okay, and you know, Miss McCann and I have joked about it. She was my principal. She made me um, paddle a child one time, and I cried and cried and cried afterwards. And two years later, I was walking up and down the hall with a paddle in my back pocket, I'm pretty sure, um, and she was telling me, you know, you might want to pull it down a little bit. But at the time, that was how we handled discipline in our schools. And that's not the way things can be done anymore. It's against the law in Louisiana for you to use corporal punishment for any student with a disability. We, um, if you follow any national education news, there was an OCR letter the other day that asked us not to use corporal punishment for any child in any school in the United States. So it's definitely a practice that's gone away. So our answer to this has to be DVIS, which stands for positive behavior. And I know there are a lot of people who think, well, why should we reward kids for doing what they're supposed to be doing? But um, Coach here reminded me today that DVIS is actually a lot more complex than that because what's supposed to happen is you're supposed to tear out your kids. And when you have kids that are struggling, it's not just rewarding kids that are doing the right thing, but it's identifying those kids who have the potential to struggle way before they get in trouble and finding what supports those specific kids need. And we're really excited to have her. She's got a bunch of training that she's going to upcoming so that we can really get that going in the next couple of months. And we really think this is going to be better uh, with our schools in groups like K1, 2, 3, 4, 5, because those of you that have had kids at home or work in schools, you know there's a huge difference between a five-year-old and a fifth grader. And when we're talking about rewards or consequences, what works for a five-year-old and a 10-year-old are two totally different things. And this is gonna allow our school leaders to really drill down and find the things that kids <coughs> really want to do and they're really gonna enjoy. RE has a program right now, an SEL program in all of our elementary schools called Second Steps that Ms. Wiley purchases for all of us. Right now, the PE teachers are the ones that are providing those curriculum lessons. And we have some great um, teachers like, um, I'm just going to pick on Cassie Binkley right now. She does the morning announcements on Wednesday. And they're all about the second steps lesson. Um, she does activities, 
school wide. Everybody at the school talks about those this week. And we do the same things in uh, junior high and high school too, just with a different set of curriculum. But again, if you're able to gear this towards kids that are the same age, it's going to be so much more effective. Bless her heart. She had it all ready and then had to have dental work. Um, so the last part of our presentation is um, about athletics and extracurriculars and the benefits that and how we're going to restructure that um, if this plan should pass and what that will look like. So we'll start with just our opportunities and I'm going to ask Ms. Adams to come up and then I'll get my coaches on standby and you're up right after Ms. Adams. You know, I could go on and on about this, but I'll spare you. Um, just because, like Ms. Guerrero and Ms. Witten um, have said, you know, moving from uh, a classroom to instructional coach to principal and now on the district level, when you're in all the schools and you see all the things, you think about what could be. And so, um, like Ms. McKeon said, we're going to rotate the art music um, so we can have art shows at the end of the semester and musical performances at the end of the semester, whichever they're having first. Um, I, I envision like art galleries and, and things like the junior high is doing right now at the Shepherd's Museum. So it introduces uh, kids who are potentially talented in art at a much younger age so when the, and music, so when they hit junior high, and I've seen it as a junior high principal, they come to the junior high and they're like, oh yeah, I'm going to join a band, that looks fun, you know, but they're not successful because they've never had any background <laughs> in music and some are just not, you know, they're just not cut out for band or they want to try art for the first time and they've never had it. Now you're giving them the opportunity and we have the opportunity to see do we have some potentially talented kids that we can push on to the next level with uh, the talent program? Um, our clubs, right now we're very limited because of instructional time and minutes. Um, so uh, having uh, four or five students in their grade band, uh, the opportunities for robotics to start robotics earlier than junior high. Uh, STEM program. Ms. Bruce Hart, right now, she tries to work in STEM with her, her gifted kids, but this would be an opportunity for all kids who may be interested in science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, 4-H, right now, we have three separate clubs, and say at one school, you have very little interest because there's not a whole lot of fourth graders that really know what 4-H is or uh, this way you have an opportunity to have more successful clubs and you have the opportunity to have more than one uh, sponsor so that you can uh, prepare them ahead of uh, competitions and 4-H uh, events like poster contests. They can work on that in art. They can work on that in, in the classroom with their, with their sponsor. Uh, we've already talked about art. Uh, you can have an art club. Uh, junior Beta, uh, we we have Junior Beta in all the elementaries right now. Uh, Union Central actually had it started it when my child was in fourth grade, and they were able to go to the Junior Beta convention, and it was eye opening to me as a sponsor and a parent what the possibilities are out there for our kids that we're just not taking advantage of. I never knew. You don't know until you. <laughs> You don't know what you don't know. And so with this opportunity, we could have a strong junior beta so that we could truly do the induction programs. We could go to convention and we can do multiple events because if you take 10 kids, you don't have that many kids to spread out with all the competitions. And so you miss out on some wonderful events at the convention. Grade level experiences. Here's We've kind of listed a few things uh, for K-1. Uh, their social studies uh, program is mostly about community helpers. And so we, we talked about having a community helpers fair where you have kids dressed up as doctors, lawyers, teachers, um, 
have local businesses come in. We do that now, but they're having to travel from school to school and the scheduling on top of each other, so this would be an opportunity. Our kindergartners have uh, Easter egg hunts, so this would be one location, so parents aren't going, you know, if I have a grandkid at this school and I have another grandkid at this school, so it's all one event. Trick-or-treating, we always enjoy that with the, the pre-K when they do that at the high school, and so you're always arranging that transportation from school to school to school, that way all are going at the same time. Uh, Christmas musical, we talked about uh, to, so that it's not such a burden on parents to go to so many different events at each school, having the K-1 do the Christmas mu musical, grades two and three, um, 4-H has clover buds for third grade. Right now it's just getting going in some of the schools, but um, we envision it being a great prep program for our 4-H. Third grade always goes to Martin Home Place. This way we schedule one trip and not three separate, separate trips. And we said 2-3 could have the spring fling. And uh, Grayson had the My VIP and me dance uh, Friday night, and it was a huge success, so we'd like to keep it in this great band. Grades four and five, we said they're older, they're not so much into musicals and a spring fling, so they could have a variety show. Junior beta convention, 4-H. There is, um, we have Bank at School, and, and with, if this proposal passes, they're gonna transition and restructure how they do Bank at School, it's a financial literacy um, program where it's for all grade bands and it's tiered to the little ones where the history of money and things like that and it's geared to each grade level. So they would be coming into still three schools but they would be servicing all children, not just fifth grade. Social Studies Fair, fourth and fifth grade, we have that now. Some schools you have limited. Uh, participation and it's a big burden on parents sometimes for those who really want to push their kids um, we think this would be a great opportunity for the teachers to really focus on that and uh, help every kid even if they don't have parental involvement to participate uh, it's a it's a vital um, skill to have speaking skills and presentation skills for kids uh, and they develop these as they go and then this will help the junior high when they have their social studies fair, they'll know what it's like, so they'll want to participate, and uh, we're hoping it trickles up. Um, DARE, we have a DARE program currently for fifth grade, and so she will just come to one school, and she can rotate her groups in, or have whole group meetings, whatever she prefers, but she's no longer having to travel to every school and schedule around a fifth grade teacher. So. All right, so I'm going to ask our coaches to come up, and we'll we'll finish off with a bang. This is the last um, part of our presentation, but um, these guys have put together a very exciting um, opportunity for our athletics program. So um, I'm asking Coach Prim, Justin Prim, who is the uh, JAG teacher and head football coach at the junior high and head baseball coach, and then Coach Jimmy Sampson, who is our head football coach at the high school, to come and talk about our plan, their plan. So I'm uh, really excited about being here to be able to speak today. I'm not going to stand behind the podium because y'all probably wouldn't see me if I did. <laughs> so, uh, we, uh, we looked at this, we sat down a while back, over a month ago, after we first proposed the idea and concept of this, we met with coaches from all levels. We met with athletic directors, PE teachers, to try to come up with an idea that was going to allow our, our sports programs to be successful. Uh, I am a coach, but I'm going to be honest with you, leading up to everything that we're about to cover right now, I'm really excited about all the other stuff. Uh, I have kids that are involved in the school system. I have one that goes to Columbia Elementary right now. With the proposed plan, we're going to have to travel at Union Central Elementary and drop them off. Yeah, it's a little scary. Uh, it's a little uncomfortable, uh, but it is what it is. And I think most of us can understand that as an adult, we've learned how to adapt to everything that we come in contact with. So this is nothing new. Uh, I went to every elementary school. We have a lot of phenomenal elementary schools in our, in, our, in our district. I don't see that one's better than the other, and I have, I'm, I have no fear of sending my kid to Union Central Elementary. I think it's an amazing, amazing, amazing school, and the same thing said for Grayson. 
And I know I said I went to every, every elementary school is because we moved when the light bill came in. That's how I felt as a kid. And that speaks numbers to adaptability. Um, I fluctuate and work in an environment that is the war zone that you guys have been talking about, middle school. Which means we are the first step some of these kids ever see somebody that looks different than them. Maybe acts a little bit different than them, comes from a different environment. And we have, for a long time, pushed them into an environment that sets them up for failure. They don't know how to do it. They've got hormones going all over the place, and they're having to be forced to adapt to all the ever-changing environments that are around them. Okay, so I wanted to speak on that. I know I'm just got athletics, but I feel like if you're going to give me a couple minutes to talk, I want to share that, okay? Uh, I'm going to be doing the extra drive, and I think it's crazy that we have a lot of teachers here today, and they're all back, and they're the ones going to have to do most of the work. And I think that speaks numbers to that. Um, what we're looking at in elementary football, we thought about coming up with a junior football league. Uh, Y'all notice on there it says three or four teams based on the number of players. We're looking at 15 to 18 players each. If you go to elementary games right now, you'll see that there's a skew in how many kids are at this school playing sports versus at this school. And I saw that firsthand going through those schools. Uh, players will be in the grades four, fifth, and sixth. This is the big one that sticks out for most people, the sixth grade. You're going, well, our sixth grade's at the junior high. Yes. I coach junior high football. What we usually get is about 25 sixth grade kids that go, I love football. And so they get hit. They go, I don't know if I love football anymore. <laughs> They're like, I'm not real sure. And we've got about 10 or 12 of those guys that really need valuable reps to get better. I don't know about y'all, but y'all remember when we went through the whole process of learning how to walk, ride bikes? We had to do it over and over and over again and sometimes fail to be able to get successful at it. Those kids aren't getting those reps sitting on the sidelines for me. I have a hard time trying to get them into the game against a 7th grader or 8th grader and allowing them to be successful. Y'all know what happens to kids when they fail. They quit. The kids that we have today are not me and you. They're different than us. They're very different. I've been in the education system for 11 years, and these kids do not respond to things the same way we do, okay? And they, the first sign of failure, they quit. They give up. So I, we thought that if we implemented this, and y'all going, what 6th graders go into this? We thought junior high coaches, high school coaches, from top to bottom will be a part of evaluation period. What we're gonna do is we're gonna put together some drills that help simulate game situations. We're gonna value them, evaluate them on a scale of one to five. And those guys that maybe struggle a little bit, we're gonna allow them to play in this junior, high, junior football league to allow them to get some valuable reps. That doesn't mean they're not a part of my team. I'm gonna make sure they understand we're all Spartans. They will still dress with my junior high team and travel with us because you never know what's gonna happen. Y'all know, y'all seen it. We had guys on the sideline that ain't played all week. Somebody gets hurt, somebody's got to jump in there and go do, do what they got to do. So uh, that's what that whole situation is about. Uh, we're going to take an evaluation period of about one week. Uh, like I said, they're working hands on. And I know y'all see, y'all think in high school, coaches don't involve themselves with or um, work hand in hand with our junior high coaches. That's what we've been missing in the past. And we're trying to work through that as well as get our elementary coaches on board too. So um, that's all. Let's move on to the next one. We're looking at having at least two head coaches involved in this and three to four assistants. And you're going, okay, well, what if all these kids are at Union Central Elementary? They're going to spend two days with all those coaches involved, which means you have more hands on deck with all those kids being there. They're going to go through specific drills for football all together. And then on the third day of practice, which they're going to get in the normal school week for us, they're going to actually be practicing plays. And y'all know y'all play. Most of y'all have been around football. You go, I kind of have an idea of what plays look like. We're not giving these kids a playbook like this. We're going to take what Coach Sampson has and his offense and his defense and go, can we teach them anything that's remotely close that will help set them up for more success in the future? And I know y'all, most of y'all in here probably go to football games on Friday night. Our push is to get to the third round. Coach knows that. We want to get to the semifinals and the state championship. And the only way we're going to ever do that here in Powell Parish is to start helping our kids be more successful at an early age. We're not doing that right now. They run one offense here, they go run another offense over here, they run another offense over here, and we ain't getting that. They're having to relearn new stuff all the time. Uh, I spent four years playing high school football here, and two of those years, we played Parkview Baptist in the playoffs. They demolished us two years. I kept asking myself why. I have a friend that's a head basketball coach there. He tells me that from the time those kids start first grade all the way to the time they graduate, they wear the same colors. They run the same plays. They have the same heartbeat. Y'all can see what's different here, right? We're very different than that. We go, well, how can we mimic that in our own country way? I get it. We all country. We got to mimic that in our own way to help our kids be more successful. Uh, so that's kind of what this was all about. Uh, teams will be determined by a draft system. That's kind of how our <coughs> program set up. 
His kids all get put into a draft to make it fair for everybody. That, not just because little Johnny knows Jimmy, does that mean they automatically get to be on the same team? Not all the really good kids being on this one team? No, that don't work, okay? Uh, I just went through that same process with my junior high baseball team. We split them in half, kind of drafted them out so we could keep those teams even. Uh, I already went over the practice schedule, how that's going to look. Oh, let me get down here at the bottom. I know most of y'all kind of have an idea what, what this word right here is, terminology. It's like vocabulary. I show my wife football plays all the time. I say, this is how it reads out from left to right. She goes, I don't know what that means. But she knows what Mary Kay is. <laughs> yeah, most of y'all know. In terminology in football, y'all know the way we learn how to speak is we, we practice this over and over and over with literacy uh, coaches and things like that. I remember Ms. Talbert in Columbia Elementary going, see spot run, spot does run fast. And at first that didn't make any sense, but the more I heard it, I go, that makes sense to me. That's the same thing we're trying to do. We want to implement terminology from first grade on up to the time they graduate. When they hear a play and they go, I know what to do on this. Now it's just read and react. And that's something coach talks about football all the time. You don't want guys on the football field having to think. You don't. You want them to go from point A to point B and make stuff happen as fast as possible. I think that's what that's all about. Y'all see that here at the bottom white helmets? I got a whole storage building full of them. We got brand new ones ordered. Try to get our kids all suited up and look good. And I think that's something Ms. McCann is firmly believe in to make sure all of our kids have the ability to look good and be successful. Uh, we got black pants coming. We thought that if we're going to have these teams, we're going to have different colored teams. Y'all know how the little wee ball set up. You got your green gators. You got your red team, your blue team. We thought we'd implement different colored jerseys. But the singular thing that you guys don't really see on here is they're all wearing one logo. They all have the same mascot. They ain't, they ain't the junior. We used to be the Trojans. People, I think that's hilarious. <laughs> we used to be the Trojans. We're the Spartans. And if you know anything about history, that's kind of common. And then we got the Grayson Warriors. We got the Union Central Eagles. And we got the Columbia Wildcats. We used to have the Kelly Red Devils. And I, I heard a parent say this when I was in this meeting last time. They go, what about elementary school pride? I'm going, if that's what you're worried about, son, we got a long ways to go for our system to be successful. I went to all those, I love all those schools, but I'm going to promise you, when I get to my deathbed, I ain't going to be like, man, I was a Union Central Eagle. I was a, no. We want to know that we set our kids up for success. Like we put that same pride logo on those kids from, and I know some of y'all are going, this is crazy, but look, I got kids that come to me in junior high, they ain't never wore a Spartan logo. They ain't got a clue what that means. If we start putting that mindset on, that's going to build a little bit of tradition and unification from the bottom up. It's going to build some pride in these kids. Because I got kids that come to me, the last a week they quit. They don't know what that, they don't have an idea what that environment looks like, and they've never failed before. It's the first time they get to have to see that first time. Oh, I ain't speaking on cheer. Yeah, I will. <laughs> Easy. Okay, what, uh, right there. I'm sorry, I, I don't know why all of a sudden I was losing my voice this afternoon at the field. Uh, but I think what Coach Clinton was talking about is we have to be able to hook our kids earlier than we get here. Uh, <clears throat> we don't have to do everything that every other school around us is doing. But we do believe that what we're doing here, what we're trying to do here, it is going to work and there's some success behind it. Uh, we have to keep up with facilities and be able to uh, have certain exposure with our athletes. That's what it's all about. And you've probably been seeing like Eli Head has been doing a great job getting his Twitter going, getting around. And now coaches are asking me about him. That's what exposure is all about. And it's not just about one person coming to exposure because now coaches are wanting to come to our practices. Well, when they come, they may come for one particular player, but they might see another. And that will never happen without exposure. So this will help with that. Also, um, I know something that we're, we're doing well here that people ask me about, and that's the four-day week. People ask me. About the four-day week, I know LaSalle Parish, for one, they're trying to go to the four-day week, and they're and Gina's coach. Um, he has called me throughout the year asking me, how is your work week? How do, you prep, how do you prepare? How do you like it? What don't you like about it? And, you know, we talk back and forth about ideas. To me, um, sharing ideas with peers is what helps us get better. Sometimes, I know one for a fact that when I learned to drive, I had a 9100, which was a stick. 
and I couldn't get out of first for nothing. Well, who taught me how to actually drive it was my teammate in high school. I don't know what about it he said or what he did, but just him doing it versus my dad, I learned from that. While well, kids do the same exact thing, and you know it. And going back to the teachers, just having our teachers in the same building, just walking with people, talking with somebody at lunch, they're able to hear and see them, how they work, how they prepare, and now they're able to better themselves. I'm not an advocate, I'm too high that I can't go visit with somebody trying to be successful. And the same exact thing as me. I want to know, how did you do this? Why did you do it? And I take those ideas and implement the same thing with our kids. I see all the time we get kids from the, um, the junior high that are in eighth grade, they come over early. They come over in junior high, in um, January. And they, of course, they're just shy and scared at first, but they're able to see how a Dunnybrooks work, or how a BJ Austin works. So now they know what to expect. They know how to be uniform because they're learning. Even if they don't go say, put this shoe on first, put this shoe on, this pants, this knee pad goes here, they just watch it. So they're able to be. So that's gonna be able to uh, help grow our athletes, just being able to be around other people, like Coach Brim said, that has been doing or excelling the athletics. Now you can learn from them. And the coach may well, can't get it that point across, but a kid can. For some odd reason, it just works that way. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so far as, oh, schools that have joined together that are around us, four schools that I talked to that also do the same thing as LaSalle Parish, Monroe City, and Washington <coughs> Parish, even though they're both in the same area, they're two different school systems, and Wynn Parishes. And they all, for the most part, have success in athletics because, like Coach Prim said, they have been doing, or it's more attention, which I think is really what it is, it's more attention paid to athletes at that age. So now they understand how to do things as they get older. So, for example, one of my struggles is, because we're going to be here every day in the summer. Okay. <laughs> Not every day, but a lot of days you would have to be. So it's just getting used to that work ethic or that mindset to help us to continue to grow. Um, another thing that I think will help, it will help us with camaraderie. And <clears throat> something I say to my team all the time is, I'm gonna let you inside a little bit. One reason why I, tro I truly believe we have not been to the third round here is because we don't love each other enough. I said it all the time. We don't love each other much. Well, what I really mean is, it's taken us this long to get together. So if we can get them together earlier, now they know, because in, in the real world, we have to do this, and all of us do it. We have to get along with each other no matter how we work, no matter where we work. And I know this for a fact, when I first came here and I didn't know anybody, I didn't go sit with people that didn't look like me. This fact, we don't do that. Usually when we go to a room, we gravitate, wherever they are, to the people that we feel like are similar to us. Until we're comfortable, now, it don't matter now. I'm gonna talk to Mr. McCann, cause what else? It don't matter. Until we're comfortable. So now they're comfortable earlier, so now, as they come through us, they are already. Um, <clears throat> something I just wrote down, I have to say it. Uh, oh, um, quick story. When I was in elementary, I went to all black school. Junior high, all black school. High school, all black school. Then I went to college, and I went to a predominantly white Christian university. And on the football team, one of my best friends to this day, Brian Davidson, from um, Mobile, Alabama, he asked me, he said, Sam, why don't you say anything? I said, Ryan, it's not that I don't want to say anything. I just don't know what to say to you here. And when I said that to him, he kind of gave me a look because he was older than me. He almost didn't really understand. I said, Ryan, I've never had a white friend in my life. So I'm really sitting back, I'm just learning how to move right now. And when he looked at me and said, Sam, you don't have a problem, just be yourself. And when he said that sentence to me, I cared for the rest of my life. 
That's just being me. And that's all I had to do. So that allowed me to get comfortable. I, and from that point on, I was comfortable in every room just because a teammate told me just be me. And he didn't look like me. Didn't come from where I come from. He was in a whole other state, two states over. And he taught me that. So it's kind of what we want to get our kids to be. And the same thing. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, another thing I, all, I also, I always speak to our team about is about vision. So my definition of vision is being able to see something before it happens. Being able to see it before it happens. Uh, so I think that's what we're doing here tonight. We have a vision. This is what it looks like. But we need to be able to see it. We got to be able to see it happen before it even gets here. We have to be able to give a chance to be successful before they even get here. Because if we can't see it, it's not going to happen. But if we can see those things work, and of course, all of us won't like everything about it. That's a fact. Nobody likes everything about anything. If you do, you're probably in the wrong place. Because there's, when you don't, there's room for growth. So I'm, as, I'm up here asking us to have the eyes for vision and the growth. Because that's what we're talking about. We're trying to better ourselves. <clears throat> the next one, and it's the last one, which I believe is the biggest, it's all of this has to do with our culture here. And this is just my belief. I might be completely wrong about what I'm about to say. This is just what I truly believe, that culture can help raise our kids. And culture can help keep them involved. And culture can help when they leave out of those doors, whether it's from graduation, or just going home on the weekend, they're going to run into a situation and I truly hope this, and I hope this happens a lot, that where they come from culturally here can help them make the right decision versus the wrong decision. So to me, this is way bigger than just athletics. And I'm, I knew I wanted to be a coach at 16. And I remember when I said I wanted to be, I was sitting on the bench, on the practice field, not getting any practice time, like those six grades, <laughs> wasting time. And I heard, the athletes behind me, some of my teammates, talk about their home lives. And I was sitting there thinking, I'm going to be a coach because it's a lot of great kids that can leave and get colleges paid for that just don't have a background. So if we can get them in early, I like to say hook them. If we can hook them in early, I think it would be less likely that they drop out of school. If you go to school, and I say this all the time, if athletics is your thing, allow it to drive you to the next level. That's okay, because I know it drove me. I know I attained a master's just because of athletics, because I loved it. So two things I had to have. If I wanted to play sports, I had to get your grades. If I wanted to keep going to the next level, I had to get your grades. Well, I had to graduate if I wanted to play in college with good grades. So it's just true. And that's what I try to tell our team. If this is what you want to do, which is nothing wrong with it, then do it. Just allow it to drive you in other places. So I just believe our culture is what we're working on. And I think that if we build it up right from the foundation, we can't go putting up walls first. We have to build it from the ground up, get some good dirt. The groundwork. I think that's what Ms. McCann is doing here. The groundwork. We have to do the groundwork in order for us to have a good foundation, for us to build a great program. A great program. That's Thank you. He is going to talk about cheer and basketball very quickly. Yeah, my area of expertise is cheer. <laughs> Uh, I, I think this just goes back in a reflection of uh, what we were talking about earlier, just being one cohesive unit, building culture. Uh, and from the truly perspective, I, I read through this several times over. We discussed it with them all wearing uh, one uniform. They're all supporting one cause. Uh, they're not rooting for the Eagles, they're not rooting for the Warriors, the Wildcats and all that stuff. They're rooting for the Spartans and what that means uh, with one common mascot. Uh, Chillers will be chose or be signed to cheer for, uh, 
for each designated game. We were talking about this earlier. Everybody was like, well, does that mean my kid has to cheer for every single game that's going on? No. They're going to sit out a schedule. you got game one this week. Next week you might have game two. That way parents aren't any more stressed out than they already are. You know, I can attest to that too. Uh, basketball will be a lot like football. You're going to have an evaluation period. You, he, I love seeing this. I told her that the other day I, when we talked about this too, was that we, we really pushed for our PE teachers to be involved in this process. Uh, I was uh, trained to be a PE teacher. I have yet to get to teach PE yet. <laughs> I've been in the classroom ever since I left college, but it is what it is. Uh, but I'm really fired up because they see those kids every single day. And they can start pushing that stuff out there fundamental-wise. I know Miss Candy Johnson does a phenomenal job. Uh, Coach Smith does too. And I know that they will be working hand-in-hand -hand to make sure Miss Binkley as well, to make sure those kids start learning some of those fundamentals to better prepare them for the junior basketball league. And there's going to be some of those sixth graders. Just like you saw a while ago, sixth graders in football, he, he attested to that. I was in that same situation as a seventh grader. You don't get much playing time. This is going to give some of those kids that maybe don't score high in the evaluation period uh, to be able to go and get some valuable reps in basketball. Uh, high school is going to be involved with this. I know Coach Dalio will be a part of this, as well as Coach Abby. And I know we all kind of know each other's names because we, we, we talk about this kind of stuff. We work hand-in-hand -hand on this. I know some people don't think we do, but we really do. Uh, we do bounce ideas off stuff, which I think goes hand-in-hand -hand with the elementary schools, K-1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I, there's no other JAG instructor on my campus. I te I'm the only JAG teacher at the junior high. I'm going to tell you right now, I would be a better JAG teacher if there's another JAG teacher at the junior high. There's no doubt in my mind. I'm not, I'm not, uh, not going to brag and say I'm the best teacher in the entire world. I would get better ideas from other people. And I taught English here. I used to walk across the hall. Dottie Shaw would be going, hey, Coach Brown, this is a good idea. Hey, this sucks. And you got to look at that with like an open mind and go, hey, maybe I can learn something from them. I think that's kind of what this is all about. Uh, formational wise, technology, uh, terminology, we talked about that earlier. Coming up with that vernacular so those kids that understand what basketball is. You don't want them just running play blue in elementary school their whole life and they get to high school and they ain't, they ain't no play blue. That don't, that don't work that way. Uh, it's more and more complicated, but we can give them that foundation to allow them to be more successful. The jersey situation will be about the same. We'll have a blue, red, gray, whatever kind of team, kind of like Wee Ball is, and they'll get put on there through a draft system, just like football was set up. Really excited about this. Year two expansion. This might be year three or four. We don't know. We've got to have a vision in place, like Coach said. If you ain't got a vision, good luck. I tell my kids in my JAG class all the time, you can work, have a goal in your mind, but if you never put it down on paper, you're just chasing wild geese. That ain't going to happen for you, okay? You've got to write that down. i got some football players that have goals written in their locker. Some of them are crazy. Some kids like, I'm going to USC to play middle linebacker. That, yeah, that's crazy. But if you don't never write it down, there's no way you're going to ever get there. Uh, our plan is to implement maybe baseball and softball in the future. I'm the junior high baseball coach. I get kids <coughs> that the only baseball knowledge they have is what their dad taught them at the Dixie Youth Park. Over there. One day, the same day I coached them their whole life, and it ain't working. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I got kids that can't hit. I got kids that can't throw. They can't catch. And if you make it really fast at them, they definitely ain't going to do it. And I feel like this is going to help my program. It's going to help Coach Barton's program over there. And I'm all about that. We, we, we already do this. I have kids try out for my team. Do you think I'm the only one that grades them? Nope. I bring in the high school staff to come and grade these kids. And I do the same thing for the kids going to the high school. Because we felt like if we built a culture where we're all kind of cohesive, we're going to have more success. We're going to have more kids buy in. And right now, every kid that I've had try out for the high school team has made it. Because they understand what the expectations are and they know what success looks like. And I think that's what we're trying to do from the top of the bottom. Oh, yeah. And we're also thinking about adding flag football, grades two and three. They'll go, well, flag football is not like football, but, yeah, it does teach some of the fundamentals. Breaking down, running your feet at the point of attack. I think that's something they need to learn how to do. If you know football, that kind of makes sense to you. I don't know if y'all know this, but we have people, we have some in this audience, that drive all the way to Ruston, to Louisiana Tech, just to get their kids exposed at this age, just so they have a chance to play football. Because we don't offer that here. We have nothing like that here. And with this, maybe moving forward, we're going to have some of those opportunities available. Um, I'm really excited about this. I think that's pretty much all my platform to talk about, so I'm going to turn this over. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, coaches. I told you, they're excited. All right, so just to where we are now, we're going to wrap this up. Um,
trying to get community buy-in. We've met with faculties. We've informed, answered questions, gathered information, made adjustments. I hope that you can see those adjustments we've made tonight. Um, we, we sent out a letter to the public asking for input and answering questions. We've had virtual, in-person meetings, share proposal information. Tonight was the planned presentation to the public. And so then if approved, the schedule will schedule events through the summer for each site to ease the transitions and build relationships. And then also if approved, we'll build out a calendar to make sure that we are um, uh, not overwhelming parents and that we're planning things that are not going to um, stretch our parents too thin. Again, and just another visual, step one, we were just beginning a conversation. We discussed it at the February school board meeting. We've been gathering feedback and adjusting the proposal and listening. The board will vote on April the 20th, and um, that will be the only major item on the agenda. And so we still have a couple of, of weeks for you to um, let the board members know how you feel. Um, about the proposal, we're hoping that we've answered some questions and actually the feedback form that we have will ask those things. Um, just before we do the feedback, I want to just remind you, um, Abraham Moslow, Maslow, in any given moment we have two options, to step forward into growth or to step back into safety, and we know that what we've been doing is safe. But we also know that if we can step forward, look at the growth that we will be able to have for our students. And then again, there are far better things ahead than we leave behind at C.S. Lewis. And that's just the vision that we have, is that the best has not already happened. We, we still have the best yet to come. And so, with that, if you're an employee, I encourage you to, um, to fill out this survey. If you're a parent or community member, and we'll put this, of course, on our YouTube um, as well and, and pass that out. But the questions are just, after I've heard this, and I tried to give you who did the speaking in each of those, but after I've heard this, I feel better, and then an opportunity to offer any more um, information that you have. Um, so thank you so much for coming and bearing with us. Um, I hope that you have, um, an we have interest in your questions. If you have more, just let us know. That's it. Do the survey. Spread the word. Thank you. Or actually, do you have any questions? I guess I should ask that. Do we have any questions? Comments? I have a comment. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Sandy Barber. I drive from the school board here in Caldwell. Um, I got up here last time and I talked about it and now I'm not um, with this proposal. So I guess I'm just going to directly speak to the school board this afternoon since I've yet to be in contact with all y'all. Funny. Every child has a price on their head in Hollow Parish. Right now it's about $8,000. I feel like with the MFP fund that we're going to lose our students due to parents being able to take their child to a different parish, homeschooling, or even to um, private school. We're going to lose a lot of fun. I already know 60 people that are talking about homeschooling. And then there's another 60 talking about private. It's a lot of money. So we're going to lose a lot of funding. And then, in a year, if legislation passes to where the parent chooses where their child goes to school, whether it be public, private, or at home, you're going to have even more people drop out. Can we afford, it as our parish, to lose that money? That's a good question to ask yourself. And y'all probably knew about the ethics. MFF, MFP anyway, but a lot of people out there don't. <coughs> As a parent, I didn't know that my child was worth $8,000 until, <laughs> until I started talking to people, watching the school board meetings on YouTube. All right, secondly, as far as unity goes, I've had a child at Central, loved it there, had great teachers, and now I have a student, a daughter, that goes to Columbia. We love that school. We love our teachers. We have unity. 
at that school. Our teachers have been with our children six years, kindergarten through fifth grade. We have a diversity of people in our schools. In our school, I've seen it at Central, I've seen it at Grayson, different people, different ethnic cities, poverty levels, it's all there, handicaps, it's in every school. As far as unity goes, you have a PTA member who's been with that school for six years. And now you're gonna take them in every two years. Well, preschool, head start, there's a change a year after year. Yeah, they're in there together. They've been to school together for that year and the next year. And then you wanna swap them up every two years. That's a lot of change. You talked about special ed and how we're going to transition from one school to another school. I yet to hear anything about our regular kids. I didn't hear anything on that. How do you tra transition a first grader to a school that's second and third grade? How in life are we going to transition from one job to another job? It's not all highs. It's not all lows, but we, as a person, have to go through all different diversities in life. I mean, are we setting our kids up for failure there? How will kids learn how to deal with change if it's like whenever they do go from fifth to sixth? Yes, we did in the past. We did. But we can still do that. That's like whenever you graduate high school, there's some kids that go to college, there's some kids that go to Bay Tech, there's some kids that just don't know what they want to do. And we, we have to learn to deal with that as adults. Something ain't gonna go away. We have to learn to deal with it. As far as breaking up the schools, I want to keep our unity and our family together. I have a bond with all the teachers in our school, not just the grade my daughter's in at the time. Kind of, when we go to family nights, what is it, Re, uh, literacy nights, we see all different great teachers. Yes, the teachers will would be at one school for one another. And somebody said, well, we meet once a week. Well, why can't you meet once a week and still be at the school you're in already? That's just a couple of points on that. And last but not least, as a bus driver, they've allotted us 10 minutes to get from school to school. Now, what they do with the buses in one, one location and the cars in another, that's great. But everybody is still going to be getting there at the same time. Not the buses, they've got us in waves. But these parents, are they going to be in waves? And this is going to be a big cluster. There's going to be a lot more opportunities for accidents on the road. Not to mention, I am one of those drivers that leaves early enough so that I get my bus to Columbia right now at 7.05. 7, 7.05. And there's a couple reasons I do that. If I have a bus problem, I have given the kids and our mechanic a little extra time to get out there and bring me another bus so the kids won't be late for school. So I'll leave early for that. Second reason I'll leave early is so that whenever I'm parked, parked, right, those kids can visit and get their visiting from the morning out of their system. Because, and you know something else on my bus? I have one of the best routes out there, I think. I have great kids. They know the rules. I teach them how to talk to each other. We don't raise our voices. We talk, just like we're talking right now. And we have discussions. I'm able to get up as a driver. <coughs> I'm the first one that sees some of these kids that get compassed on. I'm able to get up out of my seat and visit with those kids. How was your weekend? What did y'all do? 
Are you okay? I have babies that are crying because they don't want to be their mama. I can hug on them and love on them and tell them it's going to be all right. That's what those 15 minutes boards are to. It's for caring for these kids. You know, and I think every teacher would agree that they love their kids. It doesn't matter. So I just wanted to share that. Oh, and I will be the bus driver since so first in my line. If this proposal goes through, my kids, it's not five minutes earlier the kids will have to catch the bus. It's more like 15 because I will be there 15 minutes so we can still have that time. So if I got students getting on at 6.25 now, it's going to be more like 6.10. They're going to have to get up early because we're going to be at this long time. We're going to have our visit time. So y'all think about that. This is like my last plea to the school board members. Y'all really think about what you're going to vote on. I mean, I'm pretty sure most of you have already made your minds up. But really taking into consideration unity, we have it. Safety, is it going to be worth the safety of our kids? And not only for buses, but all the parents that are bringing their kids to school and having to fight traffic. Thank you for listening. I know I was a little long-winded, but this was my opportunity to tell you because I wasn't able to come to the meeting yesterday. And I wanted y'all to know, 10 minutes is not enough time per going through school. I clocked myself from Colum uh, Central, I mean, Columbia to the high school, and it took me 11, 12 minutes. So the times would definitely have to change. Sure, there, yeah. And so the, the times are approximate. Miss um, Darden put those together based on map quest and, and, and driving those routes. So there, there may be. It's obviously not as far from Columbia to Union Central as it is from Columbia to Grayson, so it is. But, um, you know, um, I, I appreciate your comments for sure. Um, I, I would hate for kids to be picked up earlier when they can be dropped off at a certain time, and I appreciate the relationship there, I do. I just, um, I think that uh, widening the time where um, parents and buses can drop off from 7.05 until the tardy bell rings gives parents and bus drivers an opportunity, um, a, a, a larger window of time to be able to flex that. So, um, anybody else? All right, well, thank y'all for, for um, sticking it out with us. Be sure that you fill out the survey and, and pass the word along. I, I know lots of people probably joined online and we appreciate the feedback and, and hope that uh, we've answered a lot of questions for you. So, thank you.